special issues of Winter Quarter. I'm so glad that you're able to be here with us today. So show of hands, how many people have been to a COSI before? Right? Okay, so maybe like a fifth of the room. That was really fast math. Um, my name is Kimberly Tate, and I'm one of the reference librarians here at Seattle Central College. This session is hosted by the library weekly um, as an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So I'm glad that everyone who is here is able to come and exchange your ideas, participate in our conversation today um, about this very worthwhile topic. So before I get started, I just want to point you to some of the resources that we have up on the board. These are all available for checkout if you'd like to learn more about this topic um, or related subjects. You can always ask me for more information or our wonderful speakers who I'm sure might have great resources to point you toward. So if you're here for um, SHS 100, I'm going to pass around a sign-in sheet so that I can take attendance, not so your instructor can take attendance. So we'll start over here, and it'll work its way around the room. So make sure you get the yellow sign-in sheet if that's what you're here for. So this week, we have Julia Ismail and Max Schumann, who will be presenting on Staples, Remaining Awake for a Great Revolution. So let's give a hand to Julia and Max. Right. 
So, um, in, in this video, we saw a very obvious choice. Do you want to take the red pill or the blue pill? And to, to have the option of, of waking up to a reality that was before unknown. Right? Um, actually, can we take a moment to turn off our cell phones? Although I'd love to hear your voice. So stay woke. What does stay woke mean? There was it, it's there's a definition that I found. I'm going to read it out loud. Um, but I know that some of us are also visual learners. So uh, as you'll see around the room, there's I, I've written down the definition as well. Now there's many definitions. I'm not just saying there's one. Um, but this is pretty good. I, 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 I connected with it. It's by a, a poet named Raven Cross. And he defines staying woke as a cultural push to challenge problematic norms, systemic injustices, and the overall status quo through complete awareness, right? Kind of in the matrix, that complete awareness. Um, but it also is something else. It's also about the act of constantly deprogramming ourselves, checking our own egos and privileges, and always seeking more knowledge and information to refine our beliefs. Okay. Checking our own egos and privileges and refining our beliefs to fit the reality. Yeah. So I chose this particular topic because uh, in 1965, MLK had a speech at the graduation ceremony of Oberlin College. Uh, and the, that speech was entitled, Staying awake through a great revolution. Now you've got to imagine this is 1965. There's no social media, there's no YouTube, there's no Twitter accounts, there's no news feeds, there's what, like five channels on TV? Mm -hmm. So when he's talking about staying awake through a great revolution, that time that he was living in, it seemed to be that there was a choice. You could turn off the TV, you can just talk to your neighbors. You can stay asleep. So that's what had prompted him to write this, uh, this speech. Because at the time it seemed like it was an option. So today we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about, is that an option today? To stay asleep. To not check your own ego. To not check your own privilege. To not fight for injustices. To not do all these things that are listed on the board. To not challenge norms. Is that even an option? And if it is an option or if it isn't an option, we're going to talk about that today. So um, uh, just to let you know a little bit about the flow, uh, I'm not going to stand up here and talk the whole time. My voice gets very crackly and I'm not used to talking such a long time. I love listening. Uh, and for that reason, we're going to do something called four corners. Um, so, can you hear that? Okay, I think I got it. So uh, I'll, I'll describe the process a little bit. Uh, as we move on, uh, but I do want to say a couple of things before we do. And I, uh, I, I want to read a little bit of the speech so I have a bit of a context. So in MLK's speech, he, he says, I'd like to suggest some of the things we must do in order to remain awake and achieve the proper mental attitudes and responses that the new situation demands. Could you raise your hand if you have an empty chair next to you, please? Empty chair. I'd like to suggest some of the things that we must do in order to remain awake and achieve the proper mental attitudes and responses that this new situation demands. First, I'd like to say that we are challenged to achieve a world perspective. Anyone who feels that we can live in isolation today, anyone who feels we can live without being concerned about other individuals and other nations is sleeping through a revolution. We are tied together. And by believing this, by living out this fact, we will be able to remain awake through a great revolution. 
And this is 1965. No internet, no Twitter, no news feeds. Right? And he's talking about us being connected, about us not being able to deny our connections. And if he's talking about that in 1965, and here we are in 2016, that's 51 years later, we have technology at, at, at literally the palm of our hands. We have the world in the palm of our hands. Is that an option to not wake up? Can we avoid our duties and responsibilities? Can we deny ourselves that we are fully connected? Our, our uh, efforts here in Seattle are connected to the ones in Chicago, in Cleveland, all around the world. Palestinians are connected to the Black Lives Matter movement. There are billions upon billions of connections available to us as a push of a button. Can we remain asleep? And if we can't, what does thing look mean? What does it look like? What do these things mean? Challenging norms, challenging injustices, challenging status quo, complete awareness, deprogramming ourselves, checking our own privileges, seeking knowledge and information. And if that's our duty, what is the cost? He could have chosen the other pill and went home and got up the next day and done his routine and had perfectly happy normal life. But when we make that choice to stay woke, there's a price that we pay. Neo in the movie, he paid the price through the, whole, through the whole trilogy, right? He's working it. He's paying for it. He's got the battle scars to prove it. So, and now we're faced with this dilemma. If we're to remain awake, what is the price that we are willing to pay? What is that piece of our, of, our, of our comfort, of our relationships? What is that piece that we're going to have to re-examine on a daily basis? That's why we're here today. We're going to talk about these two things. What does it mean to stay awake? And what is the cost that we pay? So to do that, um, oh, I also want to say one, a couple more things. I'm glad I wrote notes. In his speech, in Moke's speech, he does touch on it, on this cost. But it's, such, it's one sentence, but it just stuck to me. It stuck to me like hard, because it, it rings so true. And he says, there were, um, let me put a little context. In his speech, he mentions going to India and seeing the extreme abject poverty. And he used that uh, as a way to reinforce his connection to humanity. Right? So this is his reaction upon seeing that. There were those depressing moments for how can one avoid being depressed when he sees with his own eyes? How can we overcome that paralyzing grief and sorrow when awoken by the reality of the oppression that ties us together? You can imagine, at this very moment, how many people are being murdered how many people are being tortured? How many people are being oppressed? At this very second, people are dying. It's a state of constant, constant, constant emergency. And also at this very moment in time, this very second in time, there are people who are experiencing the most extreme joy. Children being born, families growing, people getting married, anything that, that, that that uplifts your heart, these are all happening at the exact moment. So if we were to really fully be connected, we would experience all of those things all of the time. Can you imagine what it would feel like to be fully cognizant and aware of all of the pain and suffering? That's, that's a safety mechanism that we have as human beings, right? To keep us from simply going insane. That we have to be able to understand that these connections between human beings are very, very powerful. They can overpower us. We can be <coughs> overcome by this connection. So that's what we're going to talk about today. What does that cost? What does it cost? So um, I'll explain what, what we'll do today. I'm almost done. So thank you for bearing with me. <coughs> we're going to do something today called Four Corners. 
And as you notice, you look around the room, you'll see different signs uh, in, in different areas. Agree? Disagree? Strongly disagree? Strongly agree? Like the kind of happy face, the really big happy face, you know, the ground. Okay, you got the point. So it's very simple. What we'll do is we'll ask a series, we'll, we'll state a series of, uh, of statements. And according to your own beliefs and your own uh, approach, you'll physically get up and move to the corner which most fits your response. And uh, I'm so glad that Max is here uh, because uh, he's, he's, he's here to help me describe the guidelines for our conversations. Because these are kind of touchy, touchy topics. So, I mean, they're not always easy, but that's why we're here. So Max? Thank you, Julia. All right, um, so here are the group discussion guidelines that we're asking you to at least follow as you move into your groups on these different corners of the room. Um, this workshop requires you to think about your own thoughts, feelings, and beliefs and articulate them. Please use I statements and speak for yourself and not for any other group. In the smaller groupings, you want to articulate your own point of view and listen to others points of view. Even though you are in the same corner, you may not all have the same ideas. Everyone is encouraged to speak at least once, yet you won't be forcing anyone to speak unless they really want to. The success of this activity depends on your honesty and open mind. There are no wrong answers or questions. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep it up here so you can. Some of us are, are really good guys. struggling with that a little bit. I gotta keep kind of pinching myself and reminding that I'm speaking for myself. It's kind of tempting sometimes to want to speak on behalf of others. It's just a, a language habit. Oh, you did this, or, or you know, when, when you do these things, no, what we're really talking about is ourselves. Um, so with that, Max, um, I'm gonna have the first statement. It's just a practice. Just kind of get you used to, that, used to this, this, the situation. I'm going to start down nice and easy. The first statement, and I know where all the corners are, right? Yeah. First statement. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. <laughs> Breakfast is the most important meal of the day.
I don't know what they're doing. <clears throat> so, wow, we're pretty happy on this side again. I hope, I wonder if it's the same people who answered breakfast. Because the, the groups are so large, I'm going to have you organize yourselves, you adults, you can do it, um, into smaller groups, maybe about six or seven, um, and talk about, I want you to think about the, those, those two questions that Max had asked. Why did you respond the way you did? What was it about that question, that statement that, that took you to that corner, right? And also, how did you interpret that statement, right? What did that statement mean to you? Why, why, would, why would it have you go to that particular corner instead of another corner? And I also want to say uh, thank you, Unique, for being in the middle, because uh, it brings up a really good point, and especially in this particular context, is that I gave you only two choices, stay awake or sleep. <laughs> stay awake or sleep, right? And in that is, is, is a, a binary, right? Yes or no, black or white, like it's very, there's no place in between. Uh, unique, because of her namesake perhaps, chose to be unique today. And there's a reason uh, I, I wanted to say this out loud is because when we use language, when we make decisions and choices, sometimes we have a habit of falling into one or the other, right? We don't acknowledge or appreciate all that space in between. We cannot accept that two contradicting things can be true at the same time, right? So that's part of our conversation. You need to more than welcome to stay where you are. So please, am I, do you have enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> About um, like eight minutes, nine minutes, eight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing here all the way. I'm not necessarily always the same as much as I that's basically exactly what I was saying. A lot of people don't expose themselves to the information that differs from their opinions. Yeah. And I mean, I, I would also agree with like the, the binaries, you know, the middle of the road position that some people can't not face based on the circumstances that they're brought into. And so recognizing that is that, you know, if you're um, yeah, in the dominant majority or whatever, you can choose to ignore certain things, and some people can't. So, right. I can tell myself having an opinion, you know? Having a real voice. Yeah, having a real voice. And I'm Faithful. starting to learn that even those who came before me didn't have that choice. So they're going towards more of a um, movement where they can you know, help each other, so empower each other. And, um, dismantle the system because that system is just um, and um, as as people who benefit from the side of the oppressor it's harder for them to uh, come face to face but you like you benefiting on the side of the oppressor have to choose to um, do that and everybody in between that um, they also have the choice, so whether they choose not to do it, they're going along with the system. Right. And that's the shit that they need to do. So, as, the, as people who have been oppressed, the um, they have no choice but to, um, to fight. Because this is, this is their life. This is um, the humanity that has been stripped away from them. And as people who benefit from oppressors, who, on, who don't think that they are the oppressors, but they benefit from them, um, and whether they choose to do something about it or not, that's um, following the law. Is there anybody, any of the groups, after hearing conversations and other people speak, at this time, wish to move to a different corner of the room. Please do so at this time. If for any reason, if you're so moved and... Uh, Wait, is that about the first question about, or the second, uh, the second about question? The, about the question you've been discussing uh, 
the we choice. We discussed both of them. Oh, the, about the second question. Yeah. Could you repeat it? But the, the first question, I was over there. For the but breakfast, so the second question, uh, we have a choice to wake <laughs> up or to remain asleep. Depends on how you interpret that. Well, so <laughs> if you had a change of heart based on your conversation, <laughs> take this opportunity to move to a new corner of the room, join a new group. Okay, we've got a couple. All right, so now for the report out, I would like one volunteer from each group to please share something new that they heard in the discussion from somebody else in that group. So can I get a volunteer to start off from uh, one of the groups? Something new that you heard or that you learned on these things. <laughs> Someone is in the grips of depression and they feel like they can't get out of that depression. That's the only choice that they can think of in that heat of that moment. Is it is it a choice? You know, I know that when I in my personal experience had been in that moment, I didn't feel like I had any choice at that moment. Mm -hmm. That's good. Somebody else? Yes. What I learned was a social thing. Because I didn't realize we were talking about breakfast. You know, talking about waking up and getting up. And the young ladies are saying, well, when I was a kid, we had to get up. And we had to, well, that's the same as myself and the United States. Apparently, they're from outside of the United States. And so it, it just kind of, you know, I realized that it was the same. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty much the same culture. You know what I mean? I didn't know it was that much of the same coming in. You know what I mean? So. Did y'all get that? Like social norms? Yes, yeah, social norms. Norm. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, a lot of different cultures here. Right, a lot of right. learn a lot by just talking to people about <clears throat> even common things. How about this group in the back here? Anybody learn something new? Um, I feel that, you know, we, we kind of look at it like kind of addressing things, like problems, or just like everyday situations. Choosing when to acknowledge them and when not to, and uh, knowing our, ourselves with the healthy boundaries. How about a group here in the back? Do a volunteer? How many groups are back here? Two? Two. Two. Our group, I, I uh, can recall that one of the people of our group spoke about different areas, have different attitudes and different beliefs, like different parts of the countries. Some countries, like, it's just a different move and a different uh, attitude. And, and from here versus the South. And, yeah. That's good. Um, so I noticed that, I don't know if you understand it, but we were talking a lot about consciousness. And <laughs> you said that, um, I lost my train of thought. It's okay. Um, Come on. Consciousness. And for me, the example that I used was like privilege. And so if you have like a family, say a white family, if we're speaking about white privilege, then I don't necessarily know if it's a choice whether to acknowledge that they have that white privilege. And so more of a consciousness, like so say you're, you're in this family and you have a great life, you live a happy, normal life, that's your life and so that's all you know. And so I was saying that's a privilege because there are other people in the world that don't experience that or think about other things or other factors in their lives that don't necessarily benefit them or they have to worry about these things. And so I don't know if it's a yes or no choice rather than not being aware, not being conscious of their surroundings. And so I mean, at the end of the day, you can always venture out and learn some stuff about the world around you, but then again, it's like if you're in this box, then you're in that box and you're not seeing outside of the box. Hi, um, my group talked about um, just the reality of life and, and life is made of a whole bunch of choices. And I know like there are situations where you might be 
the kind of person where you're so depressed and you can't think outside the box or you're having a panic attack and that's all there is. I've actually been that kind of a person where I've had panic attacks. But even through my workshops that I've been through, that the DBT skills that I've gotten, you always have the choice to take a deep breath and really think things out before you actually make a move. And I just think that's like, uh, that's just life. Life has challenging choices that are hard to make and life has easy choices that are you know, you can just make them just like that, but you always have a choice in the end. And I just want to, I agree uh, with that, and we also uh, discussed about how, uh, we didn't discuss about white, white privilege per se, but, but stuff like that, just how there are different viewpoints and uh, that people have totally different experiences and may be limited to, uh, you know, uh, to certain knowledge and certain way of seeing things. But it's a privilege that we really can't afford to have anyone have anymore, um, just because it's there are so many important issues going on around the world, and it's not like you're gonna stay that one person. I, I mean, unless you do stay in a room, like eventually you're going to be introduced to some ideas, and I think even if it is everyone's choice whether they can say, "Oh, I'm just gonna stay in my bubble and believe what I've been taught," or I'm gonna investigate, that is their choice. But at this point, I uh, think we've talked about how there really is an underlying urgency, and so it's not as much of a choice anymore. It, it's a privilege we really can't be afforded to just be static. That's a good point. Okay, we've got one, we'll, we'll take one more in the back, and we'll move on to the next statement. Okay, so if I'm playing by the rules, but Ms. Julia said not to for myself. But uh, what I would say is that uh, with that question, uh, you know, having the choice to stay woke or stay asleep, um, you know, if I'm looking at it from a, a context circle, there's this, I, I have this context circle, you know, a theorem that I learned in class, you know, whether it's human, you know, uh, institution, cultural, and economic. And economic is, this, is a systemic, right? So, as a human, we have, what we own is our perspectives, our, you know, our feelings, all those type of things. I can go down the list. And so, with you having the ability to uh, have your own perspective and thoughts, you do have a choice to, uh, you know, make your opinion. Um, and so, uh, and, and um, it's unfortunate though, we, we, there's another thing still called systemic, right? And that's all these, you know, construction and like, things we've been constructed of how society is. And so, yeah, we're always, you know, told to perceive, you know, told to think a certain way. And so, you know, with all the things that are going on in this world, I mean, it's unfortunate for, the, for some individuals that aren't fortunate enough to make their own choices, but it's, that's why I believe we need more leaders and more role models, you know, to help educate those who are less fortunate. Because I've also thought that it's unfortunate also that some of the people that we truly love and care about aren't in some of the right spaces to be educated at those things, you know, because of whatever their uh, experience, you know, where li their life is, so that's where we come in and we help each other. Gotta be, gotta be there. Uh, solidarity for other people who are, you know, struggling. So, um, all right, for the next statement, you guys ready to move to the new place in the room, perhaps? Uh, and before you do, I just want to remind everybody, emphasize our group guidelines. I, too, you know, find myself, you know, constantly check, putting myself in check. Uh, please use the I statements and speak for yourself and not any other group. Very important in these large groups with many different opinions. Uh, so, third statement. Those who are awake must stay woke all the time. So again, those who are awake must stay woke all the time. <laughs>
each of the groups to have one person who didn't speak in the last round to share something that they learned, something new that they learned, uh, based on the conversation that they had with their group. So, starting on this side of the room, can I get a volunteer from one of these groups over here to share something that they, something new that they learned uh, based on the conversations that they had? Yes. Um, well, we were talking about, you know, both physically and um, kind of figuratively the, the choice to, or being always awake after you've woken up. Um, and one point you made that I really liked was sometimes you can choose to be always awake, um, but then you kind of get burned out, whether it's physically or um, what you said about debating someone on issues. And sometimes you need to kind of not, not go to sleep, but just kind of recharge or kind of refocus your perspective. Because if you're um, 
always awake to everything else that's going on and being aware of all of those issues, and you get burned out just as you do physically. Um, but sorry, I don't mean to like take what you were saying, but it just cool. it really resonated with me. Yeah, we can do a couple more. A couple more. So we can, we can only do a couple more. Yes. One of the things we talked about is that really it's impossible to always stay awake. Mm -hmm. And that one of the ways you grow and learn is by sometimes being asleep. You know, by not being fully awake. And then you're awakened by something new that you're learned and you're faced with and you're challenged. And that wakes you up again. Because we don't know everything. We can't experience everything. So when someone comes to us and says, you need to wake up about this, that's a good thing. Because we can't be awake to everything all the time. Because we don't know everything all the time. Yeah. So get one more, maybe two more. Yes. Back here. We talked about how like, once you know something, you can't unknow it. So like you can't like become woke and then just go back to sleep. Like, you can't forget it. And it's but you, to stay woke, you have to like continually be getting new information, and it is uncomfortable, and it does like it can be like a bit of a burden, but it's your burden to take. Like that's like your responsibility as like a citizen of the world to like consistently be like educating yourself. Thank you. Hey, Nurse Long. I feel like being um, uncomfortable in itself um, is more of like in being woke, in the process of being woke, is more of a white person thing. Because um, for like black, black and non-black people of color, like we're made to feel uncomfortable every day, and that's like one of the steps of ours. But for like white people, like that's like that they need to feel uncomfortable at some point in the process of being woke. Because if they don't feel uncomfortable ever, they'll never realize like, oh, like why do I feel uncomfortable about this? Like. Why are they making me feel uncomfortable? Like you have to learn and that's the thing that you have to keep on processing your learning and um, expand that through like uncomfortability because that's what, that was our process um, through um, self internalizing that, um, all that stuff and then finally speaking upon it and acting upon um, doing so in the process of being. Um, I'm very impressed with the insight that I've gained today. And I'm telling you, I, I had this session kind of for a little bit of a selfish reason as well. Because I'm also on my own personal journey about asking myself this right question every time I, I turn on Netflix and I kind of watch my guilty pleasure. Like, is this okay? Am I still woke if I'm watching Empire or whatever? You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like uh, I, I ha I'm learning how to live with this burden, you know? So this question to me is, is very central. And some of the things that I, I wanted to point out in our conversation today, and some of the, some of the, con, uh, the, the commonality between our statements, was one that uh, being asleep or choosing or having uh, the ability to not feel responsible or to remain in comfort is a privilege. That's a privilege, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to say this thing too. White people have more opportunity to remain comfortable and enjoy that privilege than other class of, 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 than other people, right? But that does not guarantee that because of the color of my skin that I'm going to be woke. I wish it was that simple. I wish we were all color coded. You know what I'm saying? Like my files in my cabinet. This are for finances. This is for this. We are not that simple. We are not that simple, and we ought not be that simple because that's what makes us human. Yeah. So, say whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking it down. So before we leave, I want I want to leave you with this this story, and it's and we we went all the way. We're going back in time now. So we started with the Matrix. We got to MLK. Now we're going to go all the way back to Plato. Yeah? yeah? Has anybody heard of the allegory of the cave? Yeah. Come on, college students, raise your hands. Yeah. <laughs> All right. For those who do not yet know, the allegory of the cave is one of the more central stories when we're talking about our exploration of knowledge of reality. It's a very simple story. It's a story of prisoners <coughs> who are chained in a cave. And they're chained against the wall so all they can see 
are the shadows of real things behind them. So their whole life, they're looking at this wall like it's reality. They think everything looks like a shadow. They see a shadow of a dog, they, say, they call that a dog, right? They look at a shadow of a tree, they say, that's a tree. It's by some miracle, I don't know what happened, but one of the prisoners was able to escape that reality. He goes outside, he leaves the cave, because he sees there's a source of light. So he goes towards the light, right? He exits the cave and he's blind and he can't see nothing. And then his eyes, as they begin to adjust, he can start to see shadows. And he's thinking, okay, this, uh, this, this is reality, this is shadow. And then he starts to begin to see the actual thing that's creating the shadow, the reality. And he's struck. He's, you can imagine this feeling. You have lived, you were born, and you have lived your entire life in darkness and illusion. And you leave this cave, and you see reality for what it is. What is his first reaction? Is he going to run into the hills and... and, and, and spend the rest of his life in, in, in meditation and solitude? No. What he does is he goes back to the cave. He goes back to the place of his very oppression. And he looks at these prisoners that had spent their entire lives next to each other and he desperately tries to explain to them what it's like on the outside. This is not reality. This is a shadow. This is what... And he cannot convince them. He cannot. So I'm going to leave you with that story, and I want you to think about what that means. What does it mean to stay woke? What does it mean to continually have to re-examine your own reality, and your own place in society, your own privileges? I'm a black Muslim woman, but guess what, y'all? I have privileges, too. We all have privileges, every single one of us. and it took, have the courage to wake up every morning and say, you know what, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my duty. I'm going to be aware. And I might not be able to be 100% aware all the time, but that's not, what you're, that's not what's asked of you. Because we do need to recharge ourselves. We do need to fill our cups back up. And we ought not feel guilty about that. So, with that, go to your Twitter. Uh, hashtag stay woke, hashtag before I woke, and, 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 and be part of that. Be, be connected. With that, love you all. Oh, one more thing. Oh, yes. Let's thank our facilitators. Oh, thank you. And then next, week, next week we'll be in Broadway Performance Hall with a panel on America's response to Daesh. And we're going to have panelists from Seattle University, UW, and Seattle Central. You can take a flyer if you'd like to see the schedule for the rest of the quarter. And I'm going to ask you if you have a moment to fill out this brief survey to tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, how we can continue making these relevant and informational and interesting. All right, so thank you all so much.